Hello everyone, welcome to this first lecture um, for RAPS, Research, Academic and Professional Skills, uh, which is the module code is ET120. I'm Dr Esther Asprey and I'll be the course leader for this module. Uh, if you have any queries about the module, then my email address is here on the first slide. Um, and you'll also see it on the Moodle pages where all of these lectures will be found as we go along. So, uh, we'll start off with a humorous cartoon. Uh, what is good research practice? So, yeah, I put this in just to be um, facetious. I don't think anybody thinks that looking something up on Google is research per se, but it might form part of your research practice, certainly. Uh, you might have ideas about the kinds of materials you could use to conduct research and uh, you might have been told about whether Google is appropriate or not. Uh, Google certainly might be a starting point for research and it certainly will be useful to you as you go through your academic career. Um, Google Scholar is something that I use, uh, but that's not to say that we, we can just go on Google and trust every source that we see. So we need to reflect on good research practice, and by good I mean accountable research practice, verifiable, we can trace it back to a, an accredited, a good source. So we need to think about what good means, and we need to think about practicing research. So research not just as something that we do without thinking, but something that we engage in and try to get better at. Um, and that is indeed what this module is about, that we're going to try to become better researchers. All of us already as human beings have an innate sort of curiosity about the world and we do do research um, but we might want to think about the kinds of things that we research and how we do that uh, so we could certainly think about research that we do in our everyday lives I mean we can start from that point of view if you want to buy a new shampoo how do you go about researching what a good shampoo is uh, you might want to think about the last time that you did look up a product that you fancied buying we don't want to waste money so you might do research by conducting a sort of survey among your peers uh, and obviously it's not going to be any use asking people who are bald what shampoo they use so we do things like narrowing down the circle of people that we ask about these kinds of things um, if I want to go and buy a car it's not going to be any use asking somebody who doesn't drive because they're unlikely to have a large pool of information at their disposal about what cars are good what cars are um, economical to run uh, the latest model that might look nice so we can start thinking about research in those terms and indeed we can broaden out from lay expectations that is what the ordinary person on the street who isn't a trained researcher might do and we will find that some of the practices that they engage in are indeed practices that we as academics are going to carry on engaging in it's perfectly acceptable to begin research by gauging wider opinion among our peers about a particular a topic. So that's that's not something that's inadmissible as research, but it has to be good practice. So we have to ask the right people, we have to ask the right questions. And that's what we're going to be devoting this particular starter lecture to. What, you know, how do we ask the right questions? So the entire module, RAPS is designed really to make you think about connections specifically the connections between research methods that is how we go about doing research and the kinds of subject knowledge that we have if we go back to the cars what is the connection between being a car salesman and how we go about researching the particular car that we might buy for ourselves now i don't want to do down car salesman but if my job as a car salesman is to sell lots of cars i might actually try and sell a car that i myself have no intention of buying so I might be in my personal life, uh, I might believe, for example, that fossil fuels are dangerous. That's not that's not incompatible with my holding down as a job as a person who sells cars. Um, it just means that I, I won't say to clients, you know, this car's a real gas guzzler. But in my personal life doing research, I might say to myself, what's the greenest car I can afford on my budget? And I might believe that electric cars are the way forward. That's not to say that in my subject knowledge, I don't know about um, cars that use gasoline, cars that use petrol or diesel, but I might personally not choose one for myself. So I might have a vast pool of subject knowledge, but it's how I draw down from that subject knowledge and feed it into my research methods that we will be looking at in this module. We'll also look at academic skills. So if we're going to research accurately, then we do have to be literate. We have to be increasingly, we have to realize that research takes place online. So many, many publishers are beginning to publish, for example, uh, working findings. If you look at some of the medical journals, 
they will publish findings that are still in progress um, on their journals. They won't actually commit those to print because that process is expensive. Now that we have the internet, we don't need to do that. But we need to know all these tricks and tips so that we can pick up on the very latest emergent research findings. So in this module, we will look at how to access journals online, what kinds of books we can use. So it might be, for example, that if I'm studying Old English, well, you might say to yourself, Old English, Anglo-Saxon manuscripts, they don't change. And that's true, they don't change. Uh, but the information that we have about them may change. So the actual manuscript itself might not change. But by analysing the particular place where the manuscript was kept or by discovering a particular log that charts, you know, we moved this manuscript from a particular manor house in Oxford and the, note, the notes that were left with the manuscript suggest that it was written in Canterbury, but actually we've evidence to suggest that it was written in Litchfield Cathedral. They may definitely change this source and how we relate to this source because they may say, aha, you thought you were looking at Kentish Anglo-Saxon English, but actually this is Mercian Anglo-Saxon English. We think that this was written by somebody who in all likelihood grew up in Litchfield. Um, so we might then want to reevaluate that particular primary source in the light of what we come to know about it. So these are academic skills. These are, these are the skills that we will need to appraise the sources that we use and to appraise the methods that we use to approach those sources. If we go back again to my egregious car example, which I wish I hadn't picked, if we think about how to research looking for a car, you know, is, is it enough to ask people about the cars that they drive? What about, what about the kinds of friends that I have? If they're on a fairly modest budget, then they might be driving fairly modestly budgeted cars. And so they won't be able to tell me anything about luxury vehicles. They might wish that they had one, but they can't afford one. So if I want to know about luxury cars, I might then want to buy a magazine. So which car or, you know, I might want to buy which magazine or a top car or something like this, top gear magazine. I, I don't know, luxury cars. I might even want to go and look on the Internet. So we need to change our methods. Should I, should I do this sort of straw poll of my friends or are my friends not the kind of group I want to look at? Probably the easiest thing would be to go on an internet forum and look at luxury car users and the kinds of cars that they're recommending. So what we can see is that in, in your lifetime, the rise of um, living online has greatly facilitated some of the research we do, as well as making it much more complicated. So it's a double edged sword. We have lots of sources available to us now, but actually, Sometimes there's a bewildering array of sources and we might not know how to narrow those down or control them. Which car forum should we look at? Well, if I'm based in the UK, it makes sense to look at car forums that are based in the UK. M models of car that I might want to drive, they might be the wrong hand drive. The steering wheel might be on the wrong side if I choose an American forum. The car might not even be available in my country. I don't want to import a car. You know, I might have got lots of money to burn on a luxury car, but I don't want to import one from the US and that's often not even possible. So I would narrow down my research and just as a car, prospective car buyer will narrow down their research sources so we can do this depending on the situation that we wish to investigate. And the internet is a wonderful, wonderful resource for us, but it does need to be controlled like any other source. We need to look at certain bits of it. We need to be prepared to constrain our search because we don't have endless time. Even if I were looking for a luxury car, presumably I want to get the car within the next year. I can't keep looking in the hope that a wonderful new model might come out or a new piece of research might emerge. I have to constrain my search to a certain time period. These are all of the things that we will be thinking about. And then you might ask yourself why. Well, I hope you're not asking yourself why, because really as, as a linguist and as a person researching culture and communication, it, it should be fairly obvious to you that we, we need to prove things. We can't just advance hypotheses and not present any evidence at all to back them up. That is indeed one way of doing things, and we'll come to that in a minute. So people can propose hypotheses, but they do generally have to provide some kind of evidence, or they can expect other researchers to provide counter evidence and to challenge their hypotheses. We have to be able to do this if we're going to make any decisions in life. So research can be something as simple as which kind of bananas should I buy? You know, which bananas are the ripest? If I go into the supermarket, it's going to depend, doesn't it? Do I like green bananas? Do I eat plantains? Do I want to use them for savoury food? Do I like very squishy bananas? And it's going to depend on, you know, can I see the different colours of bananas? So assuming I don't have colour blindness or I have my vision, 
I can look at the bananas and make a choice. I might even squeeze the bananas, although that would probably get me into trouble in the supermarket. But even something as simple as that can be viewed as a research process. So I hope it should be obvious that for everybody, we need good judgment and we need research skills. But you particularly will need research skills in order to become competent practitioners in linguistics, in examining cultural issues and the best solutions to those issues. And it kind of goes without saying that if we want a job in future, um, employers value researchers. Employers value people who are able to undertake research projects from A to Z and to make decisions along every stage of that research process. So for your own professional development, and that is looking to the point, it seems a long way away now, but it's, it's not that far away, when you might want to take up professional paid employment um, full time, then it's absolutely key to your future success. I think that you are a good researcher who knows how to carry out credible, replicable research. So research that is grounded in, in thorough decision making processes, looking at robust sources and that we can then do again afterwards. So you can explain to someone how you did it and it can be replicated. Um, this kind of ability is highly valued by employers and indeed by people throughout society. So it's absolutely crucial to our development throughout this degree programme that we learn to do this well. And that's what we're going to do together. So you can see here that I've got an overview of what we're going to cover. Now, I should say that this may, depending on um, what happens, because obviously we're still in the middle of a pandemic. So depending on circumstances, we as a group, and you can tell me, we might want to shift some of these um, topics around. There is fluidity to do that. But actually, um, this seems as good a way as any to set out what we're going to talk through. So this week, we're going to talk a little bit more about different research approaches, namely sort of divide between empirical research versus rational approaches. Uh, next week, we're going to go on to the difference between quantitative and qualitative research. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit about mixed methods. And we will really explore those three in the in weeks three, four and five. We will go into much more detail about quantitative um, methods of research. And you will begin to learn to use R, which is a statistical tool for conducting quantitative research. So you will install that software. You will begin to feed data into that software and see how it analyzes the data and see what it reports back to you about that data. By week five, we will start to look at more qualitative data. So that, that is essentially data that is harder to count. OK, we can't quantify it. We can't replace it with a number or count it. Um, how do we look at that kind of data? <clears throat> There'll be a reading week, as there always is. Um, and we will then go on to look at other subjects. So we will look at the qualitative paradigm again. We will look at in greater detail at particularly stretches of discourse, so talk. We might even touch on how to research um, pictures, so different modalities, writing versus pictures. Uh, we will learn to, to research with um, stretches of discourse which are longer than just single words or single phonemes. And we will even go on to mixed methods. So sometimes it's appropriate to use both quantitative and qualitative data together and to use the approaches that go with those in a mixed fashion. We might want to look at why we do that and how we do it well. And we'll finish off by looking at good research practice in terms of ethics. That is for us as social scientists, and we are social scientists. We're not working wholly in the arts based tradition. We're working with real people a lot of the time, but we often work with phenomena that are complex and hard to pin down. So the hard sciences often work with phenomena that are to be very broad, perhaps less difficult to pin down. OK, they also work in a diff different ethical paradigm. So I will I will teach you a little bit about um, ethics in the British tradition, how medical ethics has evolved, how legal ethics has evolved and how we sit somewhere in the middle of those two paradigms. So we do have responsibilities to the people that we work with. Uh, and there's been argument about exactly how much responsibility, how much we feed back to the communities that we work with how much they should be involved actually in our research process. We'll also think about how to report research efficiently. So we're going to talk about how to produce reports that are clear, depending on the audience we want to access those reports um, and how to make sure that they are really accountable to the data that we've found. 
We'll talk about some of that as we go on into the term. But at the moment, we're not going to talk about the assessments. I'm going to produce a separate um, little video for you to look at, which has the assessment in it um, much more clearly explained. So you will find that also on Moodle this week, but it isn't going to happen here. OK, take a little break. So this is the textbook that we have online for this module. Um, it's Monica Heller, Sari Petikainen and Joan Puchelar, and it's Critical Social Linguistic Research Methods. So although the title says social linguistic, uh, social linguistics has a very broad remit in this sense. It deals with issues of culture, community, gender, race, class, sex, um, caste. And so Monica Heller deals with all of these topics. And, and it's critical. So we engage with and we reflect on the methods that we use. We might want to talk about whether we're using the best method, the most accurate method, or just the most suitable method for the time constraints that we have. So all of this is covered in this textbook, which is online. So if you go to Warwick Library, um, you will be able to access this book. You have access to this book. Um, you don't need to purchase it. It is there for you. At the same time, don't forget that there's an extensive reading list for this module, and that's also on Moodle. Um, there's a TALIS reading list and you can correct, connect directly to the library's reading list for this module. Uh, and there are plenty of textbooks suggested. And as we go on, you will find that you quite quickly need specific textbooks. So you'll, if you get very interested in quantitative research, you might need to know, for example, how to conduct a Likert survey. So one of those surveys with a seven point scale where you have good at one end and bad at the other, and you ask the informants for their appraisal of a particular phenomenon. And it gives you a numerical value. And there will be textbooks that show you how to produce a good Likert um, survey for informants. So as you start to narrow down your own interests, you can quite quickly access suitable literature. Other important texts for this module, and they are not um, in the library as ebooks, but they will be available to you um, through downloadable documents, are Leah Lita Salitis' um, very, very good guide to research methods in linguistics. Um, which was published in 2018. And then Cresswell's research design, um, qualitative, quantitative, uh, quantitative and mixed methods approaches, uh, which is a really nice introduction to those three different approaches um, and tells you much more about how to actually engage with those and how to carry them out. So it's kind of practical how to guide for methodology. And again, those will be available to you as you need them um, as documents, which will go on to Moodle. OK, now here's a little cartoon. If you just read it. So the first stick person is saying, and pirates have disappeared over the last few centuries. Hmm. During the same time, global warming has increased drastically. Hmm. So the lack of pirates has caused global warming. OK, what? <clears throat> so these two stick figures essentially are discussing two processes. Correlation, that is things happening together, things that we can correlate as having occurred at the same time point or having occurred alongside each other and causation that is is there a causal relationship between these two things and actually the stick figure on the left is is quite is the conclusion they've drawn is that pirates declining has actually made global temperatures rise well the stick figure on the right seems to have drawn a, a different inference so that the stick figure on the right says global warming has increased drastically you know has that caused the loss of pirates and we might want to think about that right i mean we might want to we can think about this even though it is a tongue-in-cheek cartoon it seems wildly um, jumping the gun to assume anything like, you know, lack of piracy has caused sea temperatures to rise, has caused earth temperatures to rise. And that's indeed why the little figure says, hmm, what? So, but the other way around would be equally silly. Um, global warming, could that cause pirates to stop sailing around? Um, and we can think about this. It's funny because actually it's, it's a ridiculous suggestion to suggest that piracy declining has anything to do with um, climate conditions. And I don't think that we have to think too long about that. There, there surely isn't much of a relationship between that. I mean, the seas are pretty much as they were. If people wanted to be pirates, they could be. And indeed, I'd argue that piracy does carry on. It just carries on on land and um, in different parts of the world. So we don't tend to get so much piracy in, in the North Sea, for example. If we go back a thousand years, uh, the North Sea was full of pirates. But we seem to be fairly well controlled now. We have a good coast guard system. Indeed, uh, you know, off the Horn of Africa, there are still pirates and police, you know, police forces around the Horn of Africa are dealing with that. So 
it, it might be quite ridiculous to suggest that piracy is declining, in fact. So we, we can interrogate this at every stage. But what I wanted to show you is that correlation does not equal always causation. We have to prove causation. So we're going to have to think about that. And indeed, if you look on your Moodle resources, the first activity I've given you um, is a, perhaps a slightly more believable scenario, which concerns ice creams and drownings. So you can go and do that activity and you can think about correlation versus causation. And indeed, quite experienced academics often get very excited when they when they can see a correlation between two variables. OK, so I might find a correlation between a lack of pirates in the North Sea and global temperatures rising. But I then have to prove that those two things are causally related, that one is causing the other. OK, and that is the difficult bit. How do I prove causation? OK, I've left you here and I'll just go through them quickly. Two, ta two more tasks which we're going to complete as groups online. Um, and you can, you know, I'll put you into groups to do this. So there's one from 2008. The US National runs a media piece entitled Top 10 Musical Countries. OK, and I, we, what I want you to do is to set out steps for a research project, really. How do we go through countries to determine how musical they are? OK, and there are steps given in this article, which it claims um, parallels a kind of research exercise. You can use those steps, but you have to defend use of those steps, which we're, we're going to do this all online. So we're going to go through this. I'm going to give you a time period to do this. And then we're going to come back to it and look at the steps you've taken and interrogate the steps that you've taken and see whether they were logical, whether they were defensible, whether they were sensible, whether they went in the right order. Um, so how do we pin down something as abstract as musicality um, and the musical shall we say, the musical talents of a nation? How do we do something as large scale as that? A whole country. How are we going to represent a whole country? We can't ask everybody in the country. OK, um, so this is going to be one task. And then the other task, the parallel task, um, in many newspapers across the world, an improvement in air quality was reported when countries restricted personal freedoms to reduce the rate of COVID-19 transmission. OK, so this was something that was noticed. And you might think, well, causation is fairly easy. Lots and lots of cars and buses weren't running. So, in fact, um, air pollution should have gone down. Lots of factories went into furlough or reduced production. Um, but we are we are lay people and we're also even at the end of your degree. I don't expect you to have much understanding of how air pollution is measured. Uh, we're going to try and think a little bit about that. So we're going to try and think about the ways that scientists of air quality um, might seek to assess correlation between lockdown and air quality. Is there a relationship with between fewer people moving about and air pollution improving? Well, these newspaper reports suggest so. And then causation. OK, how do we prove causation? Even if this time we can see that there's a much stronger case for arguing causation. How can we prove this? OK, so we're going to go through some steps to try and prove this. And we're going to try to imagine an experiment. I'll set out the parameters on Moodle. I'll give you one particular city to track. And I will tell you a little bit about how air pollution is measured. And then we will think about the time period that we want to look at and we will think about how long we would need to measure the air pollution for in order to get a result that is reliable. OK, if we just measure air pollution for 20 minutes, the results that we get could be random. But if we measure over a longer period, we might get more robust data. So the group that completes this task will have to think about those steps and I will lay the steps out for you. But you can see that what we're doing is engaging in research. Even as we start, we are engaging with research. And that's the only way to learn how to do it is to do it because you always do something wrong. You always do something that in hindsight you think, well, that could have been tightened up or I should have had a control group for that or I wish I'd read a little bit more about this. The trick is to try and anticipate these pitfalls so we can produce pilot studies if we have the money and the time. We can even look back at other studies so we can do what's called a meta review. We can review all of the studies that have been done on air pollution in the city of Coventry, for example. And that might help to alert us to the fact that, you know, on Sundays, the, you know, the air pollution monitors are sometimes switched off for an hour to help them reboot their batteries. Well, we might need to take that into account. Sundays might need to be taken out of our data stream. Um, if we take Sundays out of the data stream, Sunday's usually a very quiet day where fewer people go to work. Won't we skew the results? So we can start to think about these steps that we're taking. And these two activities, it's absolutely key that you complete them before we see each other face to face because of these conditions in the pandemic. Because I'm trying to really put enough material online for you to engage with, but it relies wholeheartedly on you engaging. I am here. We can talk to each other. We have the forums to talk to each other. But if you don't complete the tasks, 
your knowledge will be lacking when you come to class. So needs must. We're in the middle of this. And I've pr produced these two quite good tasks, I think, if I say so myself. And we need to go through these in order to have a body of knowledge to interrogate when we get to class. OK, so you're going to be making a list of four points that you consider absolutely essential for scientists testing a hypothesis. You know, um, COVID-19 lockdown has caused a rise in air quality. That's that's quite a bold hypothesis. Four points we consider essential. What do we have to consider? Four hurdles that might get in our way to try and getting an objective overview of this data. So, for example, if we do have to shut down air pollution testing st stations because somebody is ill and can't make it into work, doesn't that skew the data? If we, for example, um, if we, for example, didn't lock down until March the 19th and perhaps Birmingham locked down on March the 17th, if we were doing a West Midlands wide survey, we might have to take that into account. So you need to be prepared to share those in our seminar. And once you've done that, there's a blog for everybody to read from King's College London who have been doing some of this research and reporting on some of these hurdles. So we can all look at that and we can also bring that information with us to class. So do do have a look at that link. OK, so that's framing the activities that you're going to do. If you feel that those instructions are unclear or you'd like a bit more information, there's a forum for us to be working on these activities. Um, and you must post on this forum and say, Esther, you know, that wasn't quite clear. Could you please recap? And I will recap. OK. Let's think a little bit more then about empirical versus rational approaches. Now, there are two main approaches to doing research. OK, so the way that came to the fore in the in the Enlightenment, so the, the English Enlightenment. Um, so if we're talking about the, the 18th century, really, when when belief in religion started to decline in Western Europe, people start to find out uh, more and more about geography in the world. They start to find out that there are dinosaur fossils, um, that in fact the world is not flat and you won't fall off the edge. And some of the things that the Bible stated that were taken very much as solid research um, and that people believed in are beginning to be debunked. So sailors are reporting that they've sailed around the world. You know, they didn't fall off the edge. They've known this for millennia, but they are beginning to be listened to as Western Europe opens its eyes to the rest of the world and everything else that happens all around the world. Uh, we are beginning to be So Mary Anning is finding fossils on the coast of Dorset and people are not saying anymore, you know, these are the bones of giants. Instead, they're saying things like, look, that looks a bit like it looks like a giant woodlouse. You know, perhaps it's some sort of giant woodlouse that's extinct. Well, that shouldn't be the case if we believe the biblical account of things. But of course, people are starting to think for themselves and evidence is emerging. So in a way, um, what happens is that empirical evidence comes and challenges hypotheses that were set down in a biblical text. And indeed, many, many people lose, lose their lives um, before the Enlightenment, arguing that they don't believe in God. Uh, they don't believe in what the Bible is saying or that they might believe in God, but they don't believe that the Bible is 100 percent reliable as a source of data um, and that more data is emerging. So in a way, talking about the Enlightenment, we've covered the tension between these two approaches. Rational approaches say, I can observe a phenomenon and from it I can extrapolate that phenomenon will hold for everything else. So sometimes rational approaches work. If we look at Newton with the apple falling on his head, Newton, you know, had the experience of watching an apple fall from a tree um, and he watched it fall to the floor and he hypothesized that some force was acting on the apple. And we now know that that's true and that force is called gravity. Newton's marvelous trick was to extrapolate from watching that one apple fall. Um, the belief that all apples would fall. Okay, What he couldn't foresee is that if you go outside our own gravitational pull and you're in a spaceship and you hold up an apple, it will float about. If we'd followed Newton's logic through um, completely and never challenged it and never gone beyond the bounds of our, our solar system, we wouldn't have come to the conclusion that gravity operates differently in different gravitational pulls, Okay, that different planets have different gravitational pulls. Okay, Some planets will have a heavier pull, some planets have a lighter pull. And in outer space, in fact, there is no pull. So Newton couldn't foresee that because Newton didn't get into a rocket and go into outer space. Um, but Newton's Newton's rational approach, his reasoned approach, ratio, reason, yeah? Newton's reasonable approach, he, he reasoned out that all apples would fall if, if they fell from the tree. And he was quite correct. But in a way, 
what he also did was use a little bit of evidence. So he did have an empirical side to him. And empirical means use of evidence. OK, use of evidence to prove a theory. We can either reason that our theory is correct and challenge everybody else to bring the evidence, or we can go and gather lots and lots and lots and lots of evidence and make a generalisation based on that evidence. So that's empiricism, gathering evidence and making generalisations from it. Rationalism is we, when we observe a phenomenon, make a hypothesis and challenge people to disprove a hypothesis, which is what we should do with a hypothesis anyway. We should seek to disprove it. So we test the hypothesis. We actively set up something, in fact, in the hard sciences that we don't believe in and we seek to disprove it. OK. But how does that play out in our field? Or is what we're doing empirical research? What will we be doing empirical research or will we be doing rational research? Will we be um, stating something and seeking that others should disprove it? Well, by and large, social scientists conduct empirical research. So they they tend to collect evidence uh, and amass a body of evidence. Uh, and then try to see all the evidence that hangs together to prove that one particular facet of a hypothesis is, is the case. OK, so if I want to hypothesize, for example, that glottal stops are not on the rise in the UK, so people are not saying water any more than they did 20 years ago, I might want to think about how I do that. You know, if I'm going to conduct a search to discover whether people are saying butter and water more than they're saying butter and water, then I'm going to need some evidence from 20 years ago. So I might want to go and find uh, a set of tapes with people talking on it from 20 years ago. But then you can see the issue that I have. I've got to, if I'm hypothesizing that the whole of the UK is not using bottle stops any more than they did, I've got to investigate the whole of the UK. That's a big search suddenly. But I have to have purpose. And I have got a purpose. I want to know about glottal stops and the amount of glottal stopping that is used in the UK. How many people are saying cat? instead of cat? How many people are saying water instead of water? Has that number risen? So I have to have some structure to my sample. What people am I going to look at? Where will they be? What direction am I going to take? Am I going to look back at tape recorded um, recordings? Am I going to look at televised recordings? Am I going to look for evidence in written literature? I certainly can't get in a time machine and go back 20 years, so I've already set myself a difficult task. But I do have purpose. I have a purpose, and the purpose is to disprove my hypothesis. Because actually, I suspect that glottal stopping is on the rise in the UK. But I've got to say something that is robust. And it might be that I prove that more people are using glottal stops in Birmingham and London and Glasgow. But actually, in, in Coventry or maybe in Worcester or maybe in Leicester, this amount hasn't really changed. But I must have this structure. I must have this direction. And I must have this purpose. Or I will make the task too woolly. It won't be focused enough. And the conclusions that I reach will be correspondingly woolly and not helpful to future researchers. OK, time for another little break. OK, why do we research? Well, uh, we research to get to the truth. So uh, we could argue um, that the truth is entirely subjective. So we, we, we do see this quite a lot now because in postmodernist thought, <clears throat> the truth is an object that only exists really in the mind of the individual. Truth is subjective. Everybody's truth is different. The way in which everybody views the world is different. Well, that's certainly true. The lenses that we bring to bear on the world, our mental interpretation of the things that we see, are individual to each and every one of us. Does that mean that we can do no generalizing out of that? Does that mean that there is no objective truth to get to? Well, on the objective end, we've got people existing that a real truth exists out there in the real, real world somewhere, and we can capture that truth. The other end, the subjective end, argues that we're interpreting reality based on our own subjective experiences of reality. Well, I mean, I, I, I won't, you know, I'm not going to tell you my own personal opinion on this. You can think about this as the module unfolds, and you may indeed change your mind as you amass more evidence. As a linguist, I think it's perfectly possible to access some subjective um, experiences, but I also think it's possible to capture something of objective reality. So I could tell you, for example, that a glottal stop definitely exists. I know that glottal stops exist because I can do um, photography of the glottis and I can see people closing their glottis when they say water and butter. So it isn't a case of just saying, but I can hear that glottal stop. It actually exists. I can photograph people's mouth parts constricting and I can prove that the glottal stop exists. 
So there is an objective truth of glottal stop versus t. That's not something I need to argue. But it might get harder for me as a linguist if I ask people about their perceptions of a glottal stop. Because what we also realise is that the truth becomes layered with other people's interpretations of it. Now, for those of you not from the UK, I can tell you that the glottal stop is highly disfavoured in the UK. Uh, many of you will have had parents who you know, said to them, for goodness sake, don't say water, don't say butter. And even if you do still say it, you might think, oh, you know, I might change the way I'm speaking in a job interview so I don't say butter and water. Um, so the glottal stop has become layered with a kind of what we call an indexicality. That is, it points at social class and it points downward. It tends to suggest that you are working class, perhaps. It might even suggest to some people that you're male. To some people who heard it first on TV soaps like EastEnders, it might suggest that you are from London. So everybody will have a slightly different view of the glottal stop. The fact that the glottal stop exists doesn't obscure the reality that people's interpretation of the glottal stop is subjective. So we do have these two tensions to balance. There is an objective truth. The glottal stop exists. But the subjective truth of how we interpret presence of the glottal stop in somebody's speech, now that's a different um, thing to deal with. And we'll have to think about that as we go along, because many of you will end up um, very interested in, in these subjective understandings of the world and wanting to research them. But they are, of course, constrained by the fact that we can't get into other people's brains. So neuro neurologists um, compare what they know about the brain to shining a torch into a darkened room. It's very hard to know where do we store these beliefs about the glottal stop making you sound working class? And what we know is that working class people also have those beliefs. It's very interesting. Um, some working class people don't, though. Some people who've never come across the idea that the glottal stop is associated with working class status, they won't hold that. Some of you who aren't L1 English speakers, you won't have that idea at all, because if you learnt your English as, a, as an L2 speaker, perhaps in another country where you're not surrounded by these discourses of, oh, people who say but are a very working class, you won't have those beliefs. You may come to hold them if you live here long enough, but when you start, you won't have them. So your own subjective experiences will be different. And as researchers selecting a cohort to ask about the glottal stop, we've got to take all of this into account. And we've also got to think, which particular truth do I seek to access? Whose truth am I seeking to access? Is there a particular group I want to ask about their perceptions of the glottal stop? Why do research then? Well, I would hope that all of you in some at some point in your life have benefited from research. Anybody who's ever taken um, medicine for a sinus condition or headache medicine has benefited from research. So we knew, for example, that aspirin bark, um, people who've used aspirin bark for cures told us that it was very good for taking down fever, also could fight bacterial infection and was good for headaches, but was also used as a blood thinner. And many of us will have benefited from that in different ways. And if you think about how to research aspirin um, as a painkiller, then, you know, you need to confirm um, suspicions that it's being used as pain relief. So actually, people who researched aspirin in the early days did go to communities where aspirin, where the bark was found, and they said, you know, uh, do you use this as pain relief? And they said, yes, we do. And this is how we prepare it. You know, we boil it up and we drink it. And then we could say, well, I predict that if, if this was used as pain relief, if I can access this active ingredient, and I shall do that in the same way as communities that use it already, I shall boil it up and drink it. Uh, I predict that my temperature will fall by one degree. And a lot of the early medical scientists, they did this research on themselves and their families. Yeah. And they, they would check again. You can't just uh, you can't just take one instance. So Newton saw one instance of an apple falling, but it was only by checking that all apples fell to the ground, yes, that we're able to say, yes, gravity definitely operates because everything we throw out of a tree falls to the ground, unless it's a bird, in which case, hey presto, it has wings and it has a mechanism with which to combat gravity and it can fly. Gravity still operates on the bird, but the bird's shape with its wings spread militate against that. We have to understand complex phenomena, so we might want to understand why aspirin doesn't work if somebody is on another drug as well. OK, we have to understand that um, if we're doing biological research, human beings' bodies are, are very complex. They can be predicted that we know the circulatory system, we know how hormones work, but uh, there might be all kinds of militating phenomena. So we know that age makes a difference in medicine. Children have to be given different doses. Biological sex makes a difference in medicine. Um, what else does? Sometimes racial characteristics will actually predict certain conditions that are linked to particular sections of our DNA. These are complex phenomena. OK, 
okay human beings are complex phenomena and to check how a drug works on a human system is a complex process in similarly we could transfer this to language to check the effects of a glottal stop in english on different subsections of the human population is a very complex phenomenon and we will be looking at how to research that robustly we seek to reveal we seek to reveal truth whether that's subjective or objective or somewhere along that spectrum why do we do this to inform for example if we can inform teachers that in fact a glottal stop isn't inherently bad if there is no inherent badness attached to a glottal stop it's simply part of a sound system but we do need to understand that teachers perceive quite correctly that the glottal stop is stigmatized now as a primary teacher what do i do about that in the classroom should i dissuade my children from saying butter when they see b-u-t-t-e-r written down uh, should i say to them oh it's okay but perhaps you know make sure you write butter with a t because children won't they will leave out the t um, we want to have an impact hopefully as social scientists we, we should want some positive impact for the, for the benefit of humanity we have to decide what would be the best benefit uh, and we might want to affect a change so we might want our research to actually affect change we might want to produce research on school children's awareness of the glottal stop in southeast london why do we want to do that what changes do we seek to affect better educational outcomes better perceptions of the glottal stop we have to decide and we should probably decide with the research community at our side So um, I'll leave you with some references and I will leave you to go and prepare these first tasks for us, which will be lovely. Um, and I will just leave you with the um, with the takeaway message that we have to think about why we do research, how we conduct it robustly and in a way that can be checked, how we can confirm our findings, what we do if we if we conduct a whole set of research that is not um, clear cut. How do we present that research? Does that mean that it's null and void? And I would argue fiercely, no, 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 it doesn't. If we find no correlation, if we find no causation, that's not a problem because you've ruled out an avenue that somebody else then doesn't need to travel down. This is kind of the spade work of research, if you like. We need to have negative data. When does something not matter? And actually, if there were a fault in today's system, it's that we place too much emphasis on getting a snazzy set of results. Often, even in top journals, you will see getting correlation but we don't place enough evidence on proving causation. So I want you to really start to think about being the best researchers you can be. Robust findings, being honest when something hasn't worked, being honest when there's no result to display that is meaningful, and talking about why that is and what that means for future researchers. All of this is, is part of our duty as researchers to the community we research with and to the wider intellectual world. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you.